Hey guys. I figured I'd bring you five more dark web stories. Now, it's always interesting to know how deep you can go in the dark web and see what you can find. Now, whether you're sitting by a campfire, jogging in the woods, on the night shift, or even lying in bed, let my voice soothe your nightmares. There used to be a small YouTube channel called Sam's Online Food Review. It was run by my best friend Sam Ryder. A channel full of videos that consisted of Sam eating and reviewing food and drink before a camera. His channel garnered around 10,000 subscribers, which, although it wasn't huge, it was big enough for Sam to be dedicated to it. I can recall numerous times of sitting in the passenger seat of his car staying out of his shot as moments prior he announced he wanted to video himself trying something he picked up in the store. Only moving after he signed off with his signature, thumbs up or down, and his catchphrase, I like it or I loathe it. He was liked for his friendly attitude and happy all round good guy persona. He was really well received by his audience. Rarely were there any hate comments and, and when there was, Sam would shrug them off and keep smiling. Sam was always smiling. Sam's online food review went dark seven months ago. No warning, no notice, just deactivated. I didn't hear or see from Sam despite numerous phone calls and house visits to no avail. Six days after his channel was deleted, I called the police to do a welfare check on Sam. I was worried he had fallen ill or hurt himself. The police made entry into his property and found nothing, and Sam was declared a missing person. A week after Sam was declared missing, a dog walker discovered a horrifically mutilated corpse on a railway line. The body had severe lacerations all around the head arms, chest and legs, and was almost cut in two across the waist. The decomposing internal organs splayed out of the gruesome V-shaped cut. The autopsy report noted that although no direct cause of death was confirmed, it was likely the large slit in the throat that brought on death. The autopsy also turned up questionable findings, including the body missing its stomach and heart. Long strips of flesh removed off the chest, arms, and lower back, and that the body was exsanguinated. The scene wasn't remarkably bloody yet, and the body was almost completely drained of blood. Two weeks later, the police had identified the deceased. Despite the damage that had occurred to the corpse, the teeth were intact enough to get a viable reference for dental records. My worst fears for Sam were realized. It was him. The police investigated, but could not find forensic evidence of any other person being on scene. They eventually came to the conclusion that he was hit by a passing freight train. The lacerations and disembowelment attributed to being dragged under, and the missing organs explained away as being eaten by wildlife, or a fox maybe. Sam's mother decided it was best to cremate what remained of her only son. I stood next to her as the beach coffin was pulled into the large furnace. As the door closed and gas jets ignited with a whoosh, she broke down in tears and so did I. I stood there sobbing for the entire 90 minutes it took for one of the people I grew up and shared so many memories with was vaporized. I mourned my friend and done to my best to move on. It was going well. I got distracted, got a new job, started dating a girl I met through my work. A few months passed and even though I missed Sam, things were going well. Right up to the point where I was browsing Reddit at 3am that I received a Facebook message 
from the account of my dead friend. I froze, seeing his profile picture in the message bubble. A picture taken during good times. Sam's wide smile plastered on his face. I felt a sudden chill, a profound sense of fear enveloped in me. You know the fear that makes you cold and your limbs ache as a slow drip of adrenaline spreads throughout your body. With dread, I opened the message. It was a link to a file sharing website. I stared at the seemingly random set of numbers and letters that made up the URL, my head racing through what the hell was on the other side of that link and more importantly, why did my dead friend send it to me? My hand seemingly on autopilot brought the cursor above the link with my gut instinct screaming no, I clicked on the link. Before my finger had lifted from the click, I immediately regretted what I just did. Chrome opened up a new tab to the website. The screen was gray, apart from a black rectangle in the middle of the page, which had a play button over it. I stared at it, unwilling to click. What I was scared of, I didn't know. Around 10 seconds had passed, then the screen refreshed. Instead of the play button, the rectangle had the words auto-playing in 5 seconds in bright white on it. I watched as the numbers counted down, trying to understand what was going on. An abrupt buzzing noise made me jump. The video began to play. The camera was pointed at what appeared to be a grimy, white tiled surface. I could hear the sounds of muffled whimpering followed by footsteps of someone approaching the camera. There was some slight rusting noise as the camera was adjusted. The screen blurred out as the camera was turned. When the camera came back into focus, I let out a choked gasp. In the middle of the white tiled room, Sam laid on his back on a stainless steel table. His eyes wide in pure, unfiltered terror. The light of a single bulb hanging over the table reflected off the sheen of sweat that coated his forehead, his naked chest rising and falling rapidly in panic. He looked into the camera and attempted to yell. The noise, muffled by a tight cloth gag that was bound around his head. His hands were also bound together tightly with duct tape. I stared at the screen feeling increasingly sick, my brain failing to grasp what was going on. Before I could even comprehend what was happening, the sound of Sam squirming and whimpering was interrupted by a high pitch. Welcome to Sam's online food review. Today we have a special treat. The mocking tone came from behind the camera. Sam's panic increased. He started jerking his body, trying to free his hands. The voice continued. Today we will try what is considered a delicacy in many countries, although usually a forbidden one that is. The camera zoomed out slightly, and a man appeared in the frame, standing in front of Sam. He was dressed in a white coat with a red striped apron on. He wore a butcher's hat and a cloth face mask. In his rubber-gloved hands, he held a large red-handled butcher scimitar, and in the other, he held a sharpening tool. The man started running the knife up and down the blade in a smooth fashion, the steel on steel making a smooth sk 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 noise. Sam's panicked, muffled yells growing stronger. The man placed down the sharpening tool and walked around the table. Sam turned his head and started what sounded like a desperate pleading with the man. The man placed down the sharpening rod and walked around the table. Sam turned his head and started what sounded like a desperate pleading with the man. Poor little lamb, the man cooed. It won't hurt as long as you'll be delicious. Even from here, I could see the tears filled my friend's eyes. As he struggled, the man rolled Sam onto his front and pulled his head over the hedge of the table. 
The man then walked out of the shot and returned with a metal bucket. He placed it on the floor below Sam's head. In a swift motion, he grabbed a tuft of Sam's hair and lifted his head and started slitting his throat. Crimson burst from his neck and splashed all over the bucket and onto the floor. My friend's bloody jerking uncontrollably as blood spewed out of his neck like a volcano eruption. As I watched this happen, I threw up. I fell out of my chair in horror. I pulled myself away, not being able to see anymore. I fell again by the door. The speakers on my computer, loud enough to hear what sounded like slicing and grunting. I lay curled up in the corner, sobbing amidst a panic attack. The minutes feeling like hours. When the sound stopped, I shakily got up and walked to my computer. Avoiding the pool of sick on the floor, I forced myself to look at the screen. The page had closed, and Chrome displayed the Reddit screen. The Facebook tab had one notification. I didn't want to click it, but I willed myself to. It was a message from Sam. I like it. Last year, I did something really bad. I got onto the dark web with a few friends, and I'm telling you, it is real. There's a certain site, and I'm not giving you the full name. Let's just call it The Black Room. Me and my friends waited until their parents went to bed, and all three of us pulled up chairs to the computer. It was a live streaming site that read, Live Preview in Serbian. There was a black screen and people were typing into the chat box in another language. We just watched and waited for something to happen. A topless woman with long dark brown hair appeared in a chair. She was wearing blue jeans. Her hands were tied with what looked like thin blue ropes and duct tape double wrapped. I guess it was to make sure she didn't get out. Her feet were cuffed together with what looked like metal leg cuffs. She had a blank look on her face. The camera flashed off to dark again. It looked like someone was covering the camera with a towel. Then I heard the sick sound of a drill being turned on. The towel was removed. I heard her shouting in another language, probably begging for her life. Screaming and crying, but she couldn't move. It was a shirtless man in a BDSM mask. If you don't know what that is, I suggest you look it up. It was a black leather looking mask with eye holes and a zipper where you could zip up the mouth. She began screaming and I wanted to turn away but curiosity got the best of me. He put the fat metal tip of the drill straight into her damn eye. It made a sickening squishing sound and she was moaning and screaming as the drill went directly through her eyeball. Dark red blood began oozing out and it looked like the poor woman was going into shock. She was shaking so bad. The camera had zoomed in. Her eye was still attached and had major blunt force trauma. It looked like a big black bloody hole. Her eye was half there, somewhat. It was really hard to look at and then the camera lens went black again. We heard two loud pops that sounded like a gun. After that, it went silent. No more sound, no more video. The viewing was obviously over. Oh my god, I told my friends. I just think we witnessed a murder. They shot her. They really fucking shot her. My friends and I agreed we would never watch anything like this again. I went home feeling disgusted with myself. I hoped and prayed it wasn't real. Sadly, it may have been. I promised myself no more. I would never watch anything like that again. That lasted until about next weekend. Next Saturday night, after playing the PS4 for a few hours, we began to get tired and smoked a few joints to wake us up. Then, my best friend, we will call him Rob, suggested we get on the dark web again. 
Rob is a computer genius and knows how to get into the deep web and dark web. He used a VPN. We decided to click on the black room again. Rob told me that only 4% of the internet is visible to the public and 96% of the remaining is made up of the deep web. It made us feel a bit sick to my stomach. What a disturbing thought. It took us a few hours and the site wanted us to pay with Bitcoin and we did. I don't know how we easily got in there the first time without paying. I guess we just got lucky because they wanted us to pay next time. This time, the screen was not black and there was a concrete looking room in a bucket. A big heavy set man with this white pillowcase around his head and eye holes cut out. You could not see his face. He picked up the bucket and began laughing, showing us the bucket and then showing us what was in the bucket. I almost threw up. It was a bucket full of body parts, human body parts, floating in this clotted red goop. I was assuming it was coagulated blood. I just remember seeing bloody teeth, a few fingers, and what looked like a couple of eyeballs or what was left of them. This couldn't be real, I thought. But, by the way, the man was laughing. It was no joke. It had to be animal parts, I thought. Please let it be animal parts. The camera zoomed in and on the bucket was a white piece of paper that read victim number 12. It was written in permanent marker. Was this the remains of some poor unfortunate soul who got brutalized, like the first victim? Was this the remains of the poor lady we saw last week? Ugh, I, I really hope not. I wasn't prepared for what happened next. The screen went black again and in a chair sat another woman. This time with blonde hair and her eyes were covered with a black scarf. She was bound by her hands and feet with the same looking thin blue rope and I felt very sorry for her. Her waist was strapped in with some sort of belt holding her down onto the chair. A white sheet was hung up behind her. I wanted to help her and felt like there was nothing I could do. The fat man began dipping his hands in the gooey mess and trying to shove it in the woman's mouth. She tried to hold her mouth shut, but the man got angrier and slapped her in the face. It sounded like he was telling her, eat it, eat it. She began to chew and cry, and then vomited the whole mess up on her pretty white silk blouse. The chat box was going wild. People were typing in different languages, and the chat box was going wild. Then, I heard it. The cranking of a chainsaw. There standing beside the poor girl appeared the same man from the first video. He was holding a chainsaw. Shirtless, black mask, and all. I got a sickening feeling in my stomach. This is not going to be good. I had seen what chainsaws do to people. Chainsaw accidents are horrible. I wanted to stop viewing right then and there. But my friends were eager to watch, and I didn't want to seem like a wuss. She was screaming her guts out, flailing, trying to get out of the chair. Good thing we all our headphones on, because this was really loud. I watched in horror as he began to try and cut off her arms. The chainsaw went through a little and then kicked back in a jerky upward motion, coming close to knocking her attacker out. He must have hit her arm bone, I thought. I, I think this really angered him. I could hear him screaming in another language, so I assume he might have gotten nicked by the chainsaw. Suddenly, he shoved the blade directly into her stomach area. He pushed it in and began to cut vertically upwards, her faint screams muffled by the chainsaw. Droplets of blood began spraying into the air and onto the sheet. Little pieces of meat and tissue flew all over the room. She began convulsing, her eyes rolled to the back of her head and she was gone. 
just like that. The man slowly pulled the chainsaw out, and as he did, I could see what looked like her intestines hanging out. The screen went black. I ran to the bathroom and threw up. I think I threw up for about 15 minutes. I almost passed out. My friends laughed at me, and I knew behind that laughter, it disturbed them too. All I know now is, there are some really sick people out in there in different parts of the world that will do anything on the web for money. These people have no heart or soul. They are inhuman and sick in the head, so stay off the dark web. There are just some things you can never forget that will disturb you and your mind forever. You will not be able to undo what you have seen. Remember that. I'm writing this in hopes that someone will hear my story before I'm unable to tell it anymore. As of right now, I'm hiding in O'Hare Airport, waiting for a flight that will take me far away from here. Hopefully to somewhere they can't find me. Who's they, you ask? In all honesty, I don't know. No one does. Except them. However, I can tell you what they do for a living and why they want me dead so badly. I've had a near infinite number of pursuers over the last week, but they are not little more than the cockroaches when compared to the three who are in charge. Firechain, Beta-02, and Symbol. God, I feel chills just saying their names. The three are drug lords, but not in the sense you might think. These three run a dark web marketplace named Euphoria, where they make hundreds of millions of dollars from funding people's addictions. They don't do any actual drug dealing themselves, they just provide a place for it to happen. And happen, it does. Last time I checked, they had over one million listings for drugs. And drugs isn't the only thing they hawk. They sell guns, viruses, stolen bank accounts, I couldn't name all of it if I tried. One of the only things banned on there is murder for hire. Which is ironic, considering I'll probably be dead at the hand of one of their hitmen before the day is out. Forget their backgrounds. This story is about me, and how I wound up in this shitstorm. It all started two weeks ago, in the science fiction section of the Wicker Park branch of the local library where I had gone for the day to upload a video, as their Wi-Fi was much faster than the one at my flat. I had been staring into space for an hour, and suddenly my vision cleared and my eyes came to rest on a handheld laptop bag. Checking it out, I realized that it was mint condition. Genuine Louis Vuitton. Score. Now, I was no thief, but I had been late on my rent payments for a while, and couldn't get a raise at my shitty job. You get my drift. The bag would have been put to much better use, paying for my rent, than it would have had on some airhead web designer's arm. Or so I thought. Now that I reminisce, I would have rather been homeless and starving than have taken that bag. Regardless of my idiocy, I will continue on with my story. Keeping a lookout for any security cameras or nosy patrons, I picked up the bag and took it over to where my laptop had just finished uploading the video. Pretending the bag was mine, I tried to stuff my shitty old Dell in it, only to find out that there was already a sleek, shiny Lenovo in there that probably cost more than the bag itself. Giving up, I just shoved the bag under my letterman's jacket and took a back way home. Once I had gotten back to my place, I called my friend Gerald, who specialized in the resale of borrowed items, permanently borrowed items. I told him about the catch, and he quoted me $3,000 for the lot. I knew it was a ripoff, but hey, I had no other way to pay my rent. In the meantime, I opened up the laptop, and a very peculiar screen popped up. TrueCrypt Bootloader 7.0A Enter password. What the fuck? 
I had never really been good with the computers, much less tried using advanced encryption tools or Linux. Of course, I know about all of that now, as it's probably been the only things keeping me safe from those sick fucks. Regardless of my inexperience and ignorance, I could infer that this program was some sort of full disk encryption tool, and a heavy duty one at that. There was no downloading a wannabe hacker's password cracker tool. I would have to guess what the password was, or be locked out forever. 12345 Fail. Password. Fail. I noticed a few bumper stickers stuck to the back of the laptop. One was a Bitcoin symbol, and the other one was an onion with three letters on it. T, O, and R. It seemed like some sort of acronym. Desperate. I tried this as a password. Bitcoin Tor. Much to my surprise, the computer booted and took me to a second login screen with the username of B02. Already entered. Fuck, another password to guess. Fortunately, whoever owned the laptop before had been lazy and used the same passwords for the computer and the encryption tool. After all this work to unlock the thing, I was a bit scared as to what was on the other side of the login screen. And I was scared and fascinated. There were five applications installed, a terminal, sublime text, and something called Tor Browser, like on the sticker, a Bitcoin wallet application, and a chatting application named TorChat. All of a sudden, it hit me. I had heard of Tor Browser back in high school, I'm 20 now as the one and only way to access the fabled deep web. The deep web, as I know very intimately now, is the place where you go to buy drugs online. Of course, there are other uses as well, like political protest and cat meme sites. But drug dealing is its most infamous use. And what did people pay for drugs with? Bitcoin. Holy shit, putting two and two together. I correctly assumed that whoever owned this laptop was doing some seriously illegal shit on it. My excited fog was broken as soon as I heard a loud knock at the door. Gerald, here to buy that bag and laptop off me. All of a sudden, it hit me. I had to let the laptop go. As I had just made such an insane discovery, I couldn't let that happen. Fortunately, as well as being a low-life stolen goods peddler, Gerald was also a raging alcoholic. In all honesty, he really didn't rage. He was just a malleable idiot when he was drunk. Judging by the amount he slurred, Brendan, get your ass out here. I just want to get that bag. He was very, very inebriated. Perfect. I was able to quickly take the money and give him the bag, minus the laptop. As I was handing over the bag, something dropped out of it, a gold-plated flash drive. As he was tripping down the stairs on the way out, I thought to myself, damn, whoever owned this laptop was one rich motherfucker. Have a fucking flash drive decked out like this? I sure was right. Sitting back down at the laptop. I plugged in the drive out of curiosity. Nothing seemed to pop up though. So I figured it must have been empty. I moved on to check the installed applications, starting with Electrum, the Bitcoin wallet. It opened up a file manager and prompted me to load a wallet file, which there was one, on the flash drive. It was reading it. A chat window popped up. Symbol. Beta, where are you? Need to back up the DB for this week. Symbol. Beta. Symbol. Beta. What the fuck? Who was this person? What was the DB? And who was Beta? Shit. Back to the real world. I think I saw one of their guys. I gotta go. 
flight leaves in six hours. I should be able to finish before then. If I survive, that is. I've never been to the deep web. I knew about it, of course, but it never really held my interest. As far as I was concerned, it was just another creepy internet joke. A creepy pasta. Fantasy. I mean, maybe there was some hidden sites to buy drugs on. Or that had all sorts of viruses, but the hiring hitman and human trafficking stuff was just fake. It had to be. If only I had been right. It was my sophomore year of college, and I was at a small party with a few friends. Let's call them James, Shane, Rose, Julie, and Kyle. James, Shane, Kyle, and Rose were all computer science majors, while me and Julie were both undecided and not very savvy with tech. I don't know when Kyle was able to find the dark web, but it all started at this party. I don't remember it all that well, but at some point, we got into the topic of the dark web. I laughed a lot of it off, but like usually, Kyle and James were going on and on about it. Rose would sometimes join in in the conversation, but didn't enjoy talking about it as much as they did. Julie was really creeped out and would beg Kyle, who she was dating, to stop talking about it. Shane was always quiet. This was all pretty normal, but this time, James said he had found it. No, you didn't, Kyle laughed, claiming that James wasn't skilled enough to hack into it. James was insistent, though, saying he had found a site like the Silk Road where you could buy drugs. Rose said something like, That doesn't really count. If you're going on the dark web, you gotta go deep. We all laughed, but Shane spoke up suddenly. I should explain that Shane was kind of a creepy guy and definitely gave off a really creepy vibe, although he never bragged about it. We all kind of knew that he was the most likely out of all of us to have actually been on the dark web. I don't think any of us really knew why we hung out with him. He never caused any problems and he was a good study partner considering he was probably one of the smartest people in our class. You should go deep, was all he said. We laughed again. No, I'm serious. A place like that? You're already deep enough. You don't know what might be lurking deeper. Which is exactly why you should go deeper. Brave the frontier. Explore the unknown. Kyla joked. Shane just shook his head and looked back down at his phone. Ten bucks he can't even find the dark web, James said. After that... It became a spiral of dares, until someone had said, Sixty dollars forever finds the creepiest website. And like that, it started. Of course, as morbidly intriguing as it was, I stood out of it. Shane had slipped away during the argument, but none of us had really noticed at the time. A few weeks had passed before it got brought up again. It was James. He had taken screenshots of some site that was apparently selling human body parts. All of us were pretty disgusted, but Kyle had argued that it could have been photoshopped or fake. James was mad, and there was a pretty bad fight about it. I think it ended when Rose said that we should put an actual time limit on the contest. I don't really remember how long it was, but all three of them found more and more disturbing things that, honestly, I've tried to block from my memory and I don't really want to share. This stupid contest ended up causing a falling out between all of us, and I stopped hanging out with them and fell out of touch with them, except for Rose. We had a mutual agreement to just not bring it up, and for a while, I didn't really hear anything about it. One day, I got a text from Rose that just said, we need to talk about you know what but this is important please text back ASAP so I responded hey what's up have you heard what happened no what do you mean it's about the contest something has happened to 
Did those idiots finally find their bloody grail? This isn't funny. It isn't good. Someone is stalking Julie. What? Julie wasn't part of the contest. She almost puked when she saw the first screenshot. I don't really know what happened, but she started getting really weird text messages like two weeks ago. They were from random numbers and she's really freaked out. How is this related to the contest? Maybe it's just some creep on campus or a prank. They had pictures of her from Kyle's computer. They had pictures of them together. Kyle won't talk about it. I think it's happening to him too. Are you sure he isn't just messing with her? He can be a real he can be a real prankster sometimes. This isn't like him. We tried talking to the security about it, and they either don't believe us or don't know what to do. We're scared. If they know about Kyle and Julie, what if they know about all of us? I don't know. Maybe you should get a new phone and computers. If Julie and Kyle are really worried about it, maybe they can transfer. After that, things were quiet for a few days. And even though I was a little worried for them, the whole situation started to fade to the back of my mind. Then, I got a text from Julie asking me if she could stay in my room for the night because her roommate's boyfriend was staying in her room. It was sudden but my roommate didn't mind, so I agreed. I asked her about what Rose had told me, and Julie went silent. She said she didn't want to talk about it. Nothing unusual happened that night. We all had dinner, studied, hung out, and then went to bed. Then, at three in the morning, someone's phone started to go off. It wasn't my ringtone, so I ignored it. Then, it went off again. And again, and again. Julie ended up grabbing her phone to see what's going on. Suddenly, she sat straight up on the inflated mattress she was sleeping in, dropped her phone. She looked up at me. Call campus security. What? I said, call campus security right now. I was confused, but I did as she asked. Security guard picked up the phone and asked me what's wrong. I don't know, I have a friend staying in my room tonight and her phone was going off. She told me to call you. Julie snatched the phone from me and started speaking almost incoherently into the phone. She went quiet as I guess the guard calmed her down. Then handed me back my phone. I don't really know what is going on, but we're sending people over to both of your rooms. Make sure the doors are locked. And if you hear anything, call back immediately. Then hung up. Julie was rocking back and forth, her hands clamped to her head. My roommate woke up and asked what was wrong, and I shrugged. I didn't want to scare my roommate too much, but I told her it sounded like Julie Stalker Rosette told me about I was making the next move. And I wouldn't worry too much. No, it's not a stalker. We dove too deep. Shane was right. There are monsters lurking in the depths, and now they're coming for me, Julie whispered. Her eyes were wide, and she had a crazed, almost insane look about her. You locked the door, right? I asked my roommate. She nodded. Good. Time moved by so slowly, and I was starting to get impatient when there was a sudden knocking on the door. It was quiet but loud enough to hear. I got up, assuming it was an officer sent by the guard. Julie's phone went off again. Just as I reached for the lock, she suddenly jumped and grabbed me, shaking her head. It's the guard, I had started to say, and when she showed me her phone, the new text was displayed on the screen. It said, Open, Open the, the door, door, Julie. I lowered my hand and motioned us all towards the bathroom that connected our room to our sweet mate's room. Luckily, we only had one sweet mate, and they were out of town for the weekend. We all huddled in the bathroom and locked both doors. Julie turned her phone to silent mode. Her phone buzzed. Another text. I said, open the door, Julie. 
We all stood there, shaking. Buzz. Don't make this difficult. You're only prolonging the inevitable. There was another knock on the main door. Muffled since we were in the bathroom, but much louder. Buzz. I know you're in there. You're in your room of this building. Let me in now. The banging got louder, and it stopped abruptly. Buzz. Fine. You've made your decision. Now all of you will pay. My heart was pounding harder and harder. I could feel the pure adrenaline running in my veins. It was so quiet. Julie looked like she was about to vomit. My roommate stood quietly with wide, terrified eyes, her knuckles white as she clenched her hands close to her face. Then we all heard the door unlock and creak open. Silence again. There was a knock on the bathroom door. It was quiet, calm, but didn't stop. Julie started to rush to open the other door, but I shook my head. Something was wrong. Somehow, I knew that we were trapped. Going out that door would only make things worse. I was so preoccupied with Julie, I didn't realize the knocking stopped. I heard the sound of the door unlocking. Julie screamed and ripped out of my grip, yanked the other door open and bolted out. Even though every instinct told me to run out there with her, I couldn't move. This is how I die, I thought. The bathroom door creaked open, and I turned back to face the attacker. A dark, empty room stared back at me. I turned back to my roommate, who had jumped back, but was still in the bathroom with me. We stood there shaking until a guard finally arrived. He was out of breath and said that there was trouble getting to us sooner. I would later find out that the guard who had originally been sent had been stabbed several times, barely surviving. Julie disappeared. Police rule it as a kidnapping. The stalker took her. Kyle fell into a bad depression. Last I know, he was severely suicidal. Shane kind of just disappeared, but not like how Julie did. He was always around somewhere in the background, like a statue, quietly observing. But to be fair, he had always kind of been like that. Rose and I stopped talking after all of this. I don't know what happened to her. She ended up transferring shortly after. James went missing a year later, and some people thought that maybe him and his new girlfriend eloped. But something in my gut tells me otherwise. I know better. James and Julie both were taken by whatever twisted people we ran into that night. I'm just glad that I escaped practically unharmed, except for the psychological damage. I can never forget that night, and sometimes, on dark quiet nights like that, as I drift off into sleep, I swear I can hear a soft knocking on my door. I don't know what I was thinking, really. I had been drinking with friends and got home drunk. I decided to open tour and one link led to another. I ended up on a marketplace website that was selling all sorts of shady shit. I could buy my own weight and cocaine if I saw fit, and had the money. Though so something caught my interest. The posting said, mystery box made to order, $250. I read the description, which listed what it could contain. Brand new iPad, that was it. That was the thing that made me send $250 worth of Bitcoin to some random guy in some random place of the internet. I had vague memories of sloppily messaging the seller that I really wanted the iPad. Oh god, I remember sending them an extra $50 to sweeten the deal. What a dickhead. When I woke, my head hurt. I had a full-blown migraine. It wasn't until I had breakfast, showered and opened up my laptop that I remembered. My heart sunk. I didn't have money to waste on shit like that, but I did. I clicked the button to message the seller to tell them I changed my mind. 
but nothing happened. I refreshed the page and, as you can guess, the listing wasn't found. Now, I didn't think myself to be an idiot. I wouldn't fall for 411 scams. I know, I know no Nigerian prince wants to send me money, but drunk me, he's a bit of an asshole. I checked my Bitcoin account to see it tell me that I was out of untraceable money. I swear I had at least $750 worth in there, if you take the exchange rate of the day. But that way, it fluctuates. It may have only been worth $300. I was depressed for the rest of the day. I promised myself I wouldn't do anything like that again. But then, drunk me is a real you know. Weeks passed and I completely forgot about it. To be honest, I didn't want to remember how stupid I was. Today though, I did remember. I walked downstairs to see a large brown box on the kitchen table, addressed to me. My dad must have received it from the mailman when he was getting ready for work. I stared at it, shocked to see it had actually arrived. I picked it up. The weight was lopsided, but it was heavy. That was a good sign. At least it wasn't filled with packing chips. I pulled off the tape and opened it up to reveal a lot of packing chips. I chuckled to myself before plunging my hand in. I pulled out an anonymous red sweater. I held it to my face and it smelled like perfume. It was used. I was slightly disgusted, but what did I expect from the dark web? I placed it on the table next to me. The next item was a set of keys. I examined them and wondered why on earth was that part of this parcel. It was literally like the guy just shoved some random things into a box and sent it off. I was beginning to feel ripped off. I placed my hand in again and pulled out a small bag with a note attached. I knew what it was before I read it. I was excited. A little thing to make the time pass more calmly, written in Sharpie. It was a good amount of weed. I never bought drugs off the internet. I opened the bag to see it was the real deal and that strong skunky smell rose up. I took a deep breath and sighed. I'd say it was $70 worth give or take. I pushed it into my back pocket, worried that my mom could be up any minute and catch me with it. I was intrigued to see what was remaining. Maybe I'd make my money back yet. The next item was a small wooden box. I opened it up to see a few pieces of silver jewelry. I checked each one having no idea of what it was worth. There were two necklaces and two rings. I wondered if these were stolen or bought from a pawn shop. I placed it next to the red top. The next was another baggie with another note written in Sharpie. You'll need these. Trust me. I was a little anxious when I read the note. I was a little anxious when I read the note and saw a small box of Xanax inside. What the fuck did I need anxiety medication for? I was not one to dabble in prescription drugs. Weed and a little mushrooms was all I needed. I knew some friends who'd pay good money for that. I had no idea how much they were worth, though. I'd look it up later. I assumed $50, so that was $130 so far. And to be fair, for something off the dark web, if I only lost around half my money, I should count myself lucky. I fished around in the box again and couldn't feel anything else. I picked it up to feel it was still heavy. I placed it down again and stood up. I reached all the way at the bottom and felt something large and slender. I pulled it out. It was a fucking iPad. Holy shit. Jackpot. It was slightly scratched, but it wasn't a first generation. It was light and thin. It was at least an air. I was stoked. It was then my mother popped her head around the corner. Hey, honey. Did you get your package? Yeah, I said. Suddenly aware I could smell the weed in my back pocket. Hey, you found my sweater, she said delighted. Where was it? Uh was all I mustered. She picked it up and unconsciously, the keys too. She walked away, 
I sighed, worried she smelled the drugs. What's that? She said, turning. Oh, I'm holding it for a friend, I said without thinking. What? She said, not paying attention. What's my jewelry box doing down here? I stared at my mom, slack-jawed. She picked it up and opened it, studying if anything was missing. Well, answer me, she demanded. It was in the package, I said honestly. Don't bullshit me. Were you going to sell this? No, I promise. Just wait until your dad gets home. Jesus, Darren. I swear, this is not your stuff. It was in my package I bought off the net. Do you expect me to believe you bought my exact top and my jewelry box off the internet? Why in God's blazes would you do that? It was a mystery box. It could have contained anything. You come up with some shit sometimes. I think it's best if you go to your room. I'm 17, I said. When you're under our roof, it's our rules. I picked up the iPad and went upstairs. I laid on my bed and turned the device on. I was surprised to see it still had power. A few non-standard apps appeared on the desktop as I swiped to unlock. Nothing of interest, though. I checked the email program to see that it was blank. I was worried it was stolen and knew I couldn't keep it if there were any personal data on there. I checked the photos app. There were around a dozen photos. I tapped the first. It was a low light shot of the street. Could have been any. I swiped and the next one was the front of a house. The light was on in the front room. It's overexposed. But in the low light, it overexposed the shot and made it hard to see any detail. The next was of the side of a house. The horizontal white wood siding looked similar to ours. The next was what appeared to be a rear door. Then one of a kitchen. I did a double take. The place looked identical to ours. The one of the living room. The TV bright and hiding the faces of the people who sat on the couch and chair. Then, one of the stairs. The brown waxed wood of the floor was uncanny, and my heart thumped in my chest. Then one of the landing. This was no coincidence. It was our house. The family portrait that hung on the far side wall, even in the low light, was obviously ours. I panicked and didn't want to swipe again, though I did. My parents' bedroom. My mother asleep on the bed. The bed covers pulled taut. The next few, the covers being pulled back gently. My mother pulled her legs up from the sudden cold air. The cupboard opened, a black gloved hand reaching out and searching, a hand holding a red sweater. A dark photo of light obscuring the view. Another dark photo, this time the exposure was better, and I see it's from inside the cupboard. My dad was in the room. The next, my dad getting into bed next to my mother. Then, one of the bed, my parents sleeping. I swiped again and saw the covers pull back. Whoever it was doing this wanted to be caught, I was sure of it. After that, in the hallway again, the black gloved hand holding the jewelry box outstretched. Only one photo remained and it was above a bed, with someone sleeping below. It was me. My blood ran ice cold. I threw the iPad onto the floor, hearing it crack against the side of my desk. No, 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 I said to myself. I leaped up and saw the screen stare back at me with a rainbow mosaic of broken LCD in the glass. What was I going to tell my parents? They'd never believe me. I pulled the bag of pills out of my back pocket and read the note again. You'll need these. Trust me. I turned it over to read the date. 7 18 It must have been when the package was sent. I read it again and realized that's tomorrow. Saturday. Fuck. What does it mean? I have to warn my parents. Please, if you don't hear from me, Call the authorities. I fear the worst.